Matthew Savile is a director of military science at the Royal United Services Institute. Welcome to our program, Mr. Savile. Hello. I would like to start with the current developments on the Middle East. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah was eliminated by Israel. Israel conducted a massive air attack on Lebanon overnight, resulting in the elimination of the Hamas leader in Lebanon. Uh, do you see these air attacks from Israel on Lebanon as uh, preparation steps for a ground invasion of Lebanon? I think a lot of people like me are wondering uh, what the Israeli next steps will be. Uh, they are certainly acting as if they are prepared to go in with a ground invasion. Uh, there has been a lot of hesitancy to do that in Israel uh, in the recent past because they remember how difficult it was in 2006 and Hezbollah has spent most of the time since then improving its capabilities and preparing. Uh, but I think there are two factors which suggest that the Israelis might be prepared to conduct some kind of ground incursion. The first is that they have clearly significantly improved their intelligence on Hezbollah, their understanding of it and its capabilities, and that's what's an enabling very precise um, uh, strikes and um, pretty devastating results in terms of the senior leadership. And the second is that their risk appetite, or particularly uh, uh, Netanyahu's risk appetite, appears to be uh, significant. So they can't tolerate, after the October attacks last year, the idea of a, of a large threat on their northern border, whilst Gaza is also a problem. And I think some in Israel might think, if not now, when Hezbollah has been rocked and is on the back foot, then when? Uh, what are uh, Hezbollah's chances against Israeli troops uh, in Lebanon from a military point of view? Uh, I mean, Hezbollah has always prepared itself to fight as a guerrilla force. Um, so they would uh, suffer, well, they, 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 you know, they would take casualties under any circumstances. Uh, I, I think they would fare poorly in a direct fight with uh, Israeli defense forces, but they've never really planned to have a, a kind of straight clash like that. They're, they're fundamentally a light infantry force. They would want to conduct hit and run attacks, use their knowledge of the local terrain to isolate Israeli units, to try and separate, for example, infantry from their either armored personnel carriers and particularly Israeli tanks, uh, that they would want to ambush them, um, basically suck them in to a rolling campaign. I think the Israelis will be wise to that and ready for that. Um, and so one of the questions will be, uh, if they do conduct a ground incursion, how different does it look to last time? There's some reports that are coming in this morning that they're already sending in Israeli special forces who might be there to try and root out some of those ambushes or spot uh, Hezbollah coming. You could expect to see a lot more in the use of overhead surveillance and drones. Um, and I think the Israelis will also be continuing their strike campaign against some of the deeper stored or buried weapons. I mean, the reason to go into the south is to push Hezbollah north of the Latani River, um, and so that most of the shorter range rockets can't reach Israel. But Hezbollah still has longer range rockets, Zalzals or ballistic missiles like Fatah 110s and Scud variants that can hit Israel even if they're based much further to the north, for example, the Bekaa Valley. And I think the Israelis will want to keep on finding, or given that they know where many of those might be, striking those to take those longer range weapons out of Hezbollah's hands. How could Iran respond uh, in case of the ground invasion of Lebanon and uh, in case uh, if there would not be any kind of invasion by Israel? How, what are uh, current Iranian options? What are their options for the retaliation uh, from your perspective? 
I mean, Iran's options are pretty limited, assuming it is still trying to avoid a direct war with Israel. And that's because its whole strategy in the region has been set up to use proxies and partners like Hezbollah and Hamas as a deterrent. So uh, to defend against an Israeli direct attack on Iran. And that worked whilst the conflict was kept at a low level um, and whilst Iran, if you like, stayed out in terms of involving itself directly, although it's had its uh, special operators, the Quds Force, on the ground in Israel, uh, sorry, in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq for years. The problem is, is that as those proxies and partners have been pulled into more uh, a, a greater level of fighting with the Israelis, it's clear that Iran is not going to go to war on their behalf. So that creates a bit of pressure in the relationship. It also means if Israel is prepared to escalate, uh, Iran is, is in a bit of a bind because it doesn't really really want to take them on directly. Of course, it did in April this year, after some of their Quds Force officers were killed in Syria, and they struck directly at Israel, and that attack, attack had almost no direct impact because almost all of the projectiles were shot down either by partners of Israel or by Israeli defences. So Iran's got a bit of a dilemma, which is it could encourage those partners to attack Israel again, but they will be exposed to counter-strike, or it could try another direct attack, but that didn't work last time, and the Israelis were able to show that they can basically pierce Iranian air defences. Or there is an option, which is it goes back to a kind of classic school, which is that it sponsors or supports terrorist attacks elsewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, the Israelis will probably react to that as well, and, and they might not reach the threshold for Iran to re-establish its uh, reputation and the deterrence of its proxies. How do you see the risks for a nuclear conflict on the Middle East? Because uh, Israel is, is, uh, could have a nuclear weapon as well as Iran. What is your, what is your take on that? I think the prospects of Israel using its, you know, alleged, because it's never declared them, uh, nuclear weapons are, are, are pretty low. Um, uh, they have such strong conventional superiority that it's, uh, it, that it, it's more useful for them uh, to use uh, those capabilities. The question is whether or not the Iranians are tempted to turn their existing nuclear program into a weapons program and rush towards a bomb, so-called breakout. And the logic goes, uh, that's their ultimate deterrent, because if the proxies and partners are stripped away and their conventional forces are so weak, is that the only thing they've got left? The challenge for them will be that does invite then the Israelis to just strike at their nuclear program to prevent that happening. Could they do it without it being detected? Um, and I think given Israeli intelligence penetration of Hezbollah and potentially the Iranian system, they might have some doubts over, over how feasible that is. And do they get more leverage and influence from hovering just below that threshold? The, the problem is, is that, um, again, that's a deterrent only in so far as you can create uncertainty in the mind of your adversaries. So Iran feels quite constrained here at the moment, although we shouldn't forget it still has a very strong position in Iraq, lots of influence um, and partners there. Uh, and the Houthis are struggling to strike Israel effectively, but they can continue to make life difficult for trade in the Red Sea. Uh, also, from your perspective, uh, how do you, how this um, developments could change the balance of power on the Middle East? Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that the killing of uh, most of Hezbollah leaders would dramatically change the balance of power uh, in the region. Uh, how, what is your take on that? And uh, uh, could this elimination, decapitation of the uh, 
uh, Hezbollah leadership uh, really solve Hezbollah's problem, problem of Hezbollah and other proxy, uh, proxy forces in the region. So there's, it looks like there's an opportunity here, which is that this is probably the most significant series of setbacks that uh, the Iranians and their partners have suffered in maybe 20 years, uh, possibly longer, insofar as uh, the deterrent effect of those proxies towards Israel isn't holding, um, they're not having the impact that has been desired, and uh, Israel looks like it's definitely on the front foot. Uh, but I think uh, there is um, a question about how that plays out in each area. So Gaza, for example, uh, there is sort of the question of once Hamas has been militarily defeated, um, what are Israel's next steps? Um, does that uh, simply lead to them or some other form of Palestinian resistance regenerating over time? Hezbollah is definitely looking much weaker in Lebanon. But is there a Lebanese internal force or a number of Lebanese forces who are able to take advantage of that? I mean, uh, Hezbollah has got plenty of enemies inside Lebanon, um, but they are so split uh, that many people much more expert than I would tell you the chance of them unifying might be quite limited. Um, and indeed, that's sort of because Lebanon has got such deep memories of the devastation of the civil war, or it has deliberately created this sort of fragmented structure so that um, uh, they don't effectively you know, trigger another civil war. The, the problem is, is that Hezbollah has taken advantage of that to become the de facto uh, security in many areas with the net effect that the Lebanese armed forces uh, are not uh, that strong. So I think there's there, it looks like there's a potential for some kind of vacuum to emerge in terms of Iran's overseas influence, but it's not clear if there are people well-placed to take advantage of it. Um, and as I said, in Iraq, um, Iran still sits very much with uh, allies and partners spread throughout the security forces, the government and the judiciary. Do you feel that potential ground invasion, ground operation inside Lebanon could fully destroy Hezbollah and the full ideology of this organization? Or uh, on the other hand, what are the risks for uh, another situation, uh, other side of the coin? Could it also uh, turn the tide into the Iranian favor just to uh, help uh, their uh, Iranian narrative and help the Hezbollah's ideology from your perspective? Um, it, I think it, this is a big unknown, which is that what military capability Hezbollah has left, a ground incursion could deal significant damage um, simply by killing lots of its ground forces or exposing that weakness. And it feels like um, the Israelis are briefings if they're making good progress in destroying those larger rocket stocks. Whether or not it completely destroys them is, is another question. Uh, they have obviously frequently presented themselves as you know, the defenders of Lebanon. And failure to prevent a ground incursion or to mount an effective defence would deal a genuinely severe blow to that amongst many people who already hate them because, of course, they have run a campaign of assassinations and racketeering uh, in Lebanese society for years. On the other hand, what we don't know is how Israeli strikes, particularly in and around Beirut, are creating people who would be significantly opposed to a Lebanese ground invasion, uh, sorry, an Israeli ground invasion right now, regardless of the fact that it would help rid them of Hezbollah. Um, there has obviously been a, a quite a large number of civilian casualties. The Israelis would say those are unfortunate but proportionate uh, casualties, uh, bearing in mind what they're going after. But uh, it's 
I, it's very doubtful that people would welcome a devastating ground war uh, of any duration, uh, even if it were, in theory, only, and I say that advisedly, limited to southern Lebanon. U.S. President Joe Biden says that the full-scale war on the Middle East should be avoided. What are the current risks of the, for the direct involvement of the U.S. troops in the uh, full-scale conflict on the Middle East? I think there are probably two uh, uh, areas, um, uh, although they're, 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 they're very similar, which is that if uh, the Israelis go into Lebanon, and then there's retaliation against that via more direct, direct attacks towards Israel from proxies and potentially sucking in Iran, then either US forces could be called upon to defend Israel again against uh, large airstrikes, or US forces in the Middle East and other international partners who operate in the Middle East, for example, the UK, could be the target of attacks by Iranian proxies and partners. You know, Iraq is a good example. Uh, the counter-Islamic state campaign looks like it's drawing to a close and um, the international coalition will be withdrawing at some point. But you might find uh, uh, militias and others attempting to hurry them out the door by attacking them and then claiming credit for them going or simply trying to target vulnerable international personnel who are operating uh, on their own or in very small numbers. Um, and, you know, that extends out to sea where you might find more attacks on shipping. Again, if you move to a general or a regional war and suddenly you've got mining in the Strait of Hormuz or cruise or ballistic missile attacks in the Red Sea trying to shut the Bab al-Mandab to, to shipping, these are all scenarios under which you could see international forces being sucked in, either because they're directly attacked or because they are defending civilian shipping or, or other um, you know, civilians in the area. Hezbollah's uh, senior leadership had uh, almost all been eliminated. I would like to cover this strategy regarding the Ukrainian case, the war in Ukraine. Uh, do you see the stra stra this strategy as a successful one for destroying, for winning for prevailing uh, over your enemy? Would it be also effective for Ukraine to try to eliminate the Russia's chain of command in the Russian army? So it, it often depends on what effect you're trying to create. So in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, network attack like that or decapitation strikes, taking out the leadership, doesn't have a great record of success on its own. Um, I can think of a couple of examples, actually, uh, where it has uh, had an impact. Um, but it's often the case where it's part of a broader campaign. Um, so what we can see at the moment is that decapitation of Hezbollah's leadership appears to have seriously disorientated the organisation. It's not managing effective communications. It's not managing effective counterattacks or retaliation. Um, it's... Uh, trying to basically regain its bearings. If there is no more activity, it is possible that 10 years from now, and you would be looking at a long time, Hezbollah might have recovered, in which case you would have said, well, was it all worth it? Um, but it, it clearly has a tactical advantage. So the, principle, the same principle is true in war, which is that attacking your opponent's communications, its command and control, individuals can have a significant impact if it is timed with other action. For example, if you're launching a major operation, um, but if it's done in the abstract on its own, uh, you, can, you can unnerve your adversary, you can create a psychological impact, but the battlefield impact might be limited. I think what many people will be studying is the techniques and the technology that Israel has used here, if it if it's prepared to talk about them at some point, and trying to understand what that tells us and what lessons we can draw from the use of large databases. Uh, was artificial intelligence used to sift through the data? What kind of information was collected? Uh, it's all come from the media thus far, but there are some suggestions that, for example, 
Hezbollah officers and fighters put lots of details on social media and those were all collected by the Israelis to begin to identify them on an individual basis. Um, now, in many respects, that tells us something we already knew, which is that in war, you know, loose lips cost lives, sink ships in the old um, British Second World War propaganda. So um, I, I think there will be an awful lot of looking at te- te- techniques and tactics as much as the broader idea. That also covers the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian armed forces have been successfully conducted a, be- a deep battle against uh, Uh, Russian uh, military installations, including recent attacks on in Tver, ammunition depot, and also in Krasnodar region. Why does Russia fail to protect its own ammunition depot from Ukrainian attacks, even uh, so deep inside the Russian territory? So, the, I mean, it's, it's difficult to know for certain, but what seems to be emerging is that. Uh, There is just enormous difficulty in covering the huge geographic spread over which the Ukrainians are able to launch attacks. Um, so they are launching increasingly large numbers of drones. It's, it's worth remembering that we, we often see a few at the end, but uh, there are probably dozens that are launched to get down to that small number that make it through. Um, but the by attacking in a number of different directions. I mean, these, these targets are to the north of Ukraine, they're to the northeast, they're to the east, south, you know, um, in essence, um, at, at targets all the way around uh, uh, the border and deep into Russia. And that's stretching Russian air defenses. And they've obviously kept back a fair amount to try and protect Moscow. And they've had to move potentially new ones into Crimea. They're having to protect near the front line. Um, at a certain point, there's only so much area that they can cover. And then, of course, the Ukrainian forces have managed to attack and destroy both ground-based air defences, but also the radars that enable those to be targeted. So I think it's a combination of spread of targets, uh, Ukrainian targeting of defences, and probably some ingenious use of technology, maybe jamming or decoys, all of which mean it's actually proven quite difficult to protect everywhere all at once. Also, British intelligence reported that this recent Ukrainian drone attacks on Russia would cause a short-term disruption to Russia's ammunition supply. How could it influence Russia's war efforts in Ukraine? Some people, and I've included myself in this, have been a bit sceptical about the extent to which the deep strike campaign can compensate for uh, the battle at the front line. And there are still big issues there in terms of mobilization, training and equipment supply. But the fact that the uh, Ukrainian forces have been able to increase both the volume and the number of these attacks and being so successful, I think gives someone like me a bit of pause to question that judgment because um, the scale of some of the destruction being caused is reasonably significant. So the estimate that has been made is that some of these ammo dumps that have been destroyed look like they might have contained weeks and weeks, maybe even months worth of ammunition supply and material. Now, it's not at the front line yet, but it was presumably being prepared to go to the front line, or is the backup and the reserve over the next few months? So I suspect the the argument from uh, senior Ukrainian officers would be, if they can continue this kind of volume of successful attacks, and maybe even ramp them up, and hit Russian defense industry, they can begin to eat into that industrial advantage that Russia has. Um, And they'll still have a personnel advantage, numbers, uh, for the time being. But if they begin to run low on stocks of ammunition um, and artillery, and artillery is key still, as well as drones and 
particularly deep strike missiles, then the Russian uh, at very slow advances really will begin to run out of steam. And what's more, Russia will have to re-divert some of its industrial effort to rebuilding itself. And so that, for example, that shell advantage that exists on the front line will begin to be eaten into, uh, and Russia will have to spend more money to compensate. Also, U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies believe that uh, Russia could conduct a lethal attack on the West if the West agrees to pro provide Ukraine with authorization to strike deep inside Russia with Western-made weapons. Uh, do you agree with such assessment? I think there's a, little, there's a lot of questions about what Russian retaliation and escalation would look like if Western weapons were to be used to strike into Russia. There's a few things to be said about that. The first is that there are already Western weapons charging around in... Uh, oops, sorry. Hang on. I need to turn my light back on. I was, I was, sorry, I'll start again. Um, there's a lot of debate about what uh, Russian retaliation looks like in the event that Western weapons are used uh, to attack targets in Russia. I think the first thing to be said on that is that Western weapons are already being used inside Russian territory. You know, we've seen armored vehicles, we've seen tanks, we have seen Ukrainian jets using um, bombs provided by the international community. And I think the way that Russia has regarded that so far on the battlefield is simply an extension of the conventional fight. The same is true of, the, for example, the HIMARS and other guided multiple launch rocket systems. The Ukrainian argument would be there's no real difference in using, for example, Storm Shadow or Attackums, and I think there's a fair degree of weight to that. I think the unfortunate thing that backs that up is that because some of the best targets, uh, Russian helicopters and jets using glide bombs, have moved out of range, the impact would probably be limited. Um, and therefore, it doesn't make sense for Russia to radically escalate. Uh, there are still targets for both Attackums and Storm Shadow, bunkers, headquarters, and uh, Russian air defense systems that you could use one, you know, one or one or the other against. Um, so it's not that they'll have no impact. There are plenty of targets, uh, but it's just something else to add into the fight. The other thing is, is they haven't really done anything that shows they're serious about their nuclear threats. So they haven't increased the posture of any of their nuclear forces that has been detected. They would want people to spot that if it were true, because they want to send a credible message. And so that suggests that a lot of this is rhetoric to, if you like, scare the international community. There is the issue, finally, of... Russian direct retaliation or attacks, where there is already a sabotage campaign that appears to be running, and opportunities elsewhere, for example, the Middle East, where Russia could be more disruptive and support other countries like Iran. I think international backers should be concerned about both sabotage and Russian escalation elsewhere, um, but that seems more likely than a direct attack, for example, on a NATO country, because for the, most of the rest of this conflict, Russian escalation in a direct military sense has actually been against Ukraine and predominantly against civilian targets or infrastructure to try and achieve a more significant blow. And of course, they're probably going to do that again this autumn and into the winter to try and really ramp up the pressure on the government. Thank you, Mr. Savile, for your time and for your support for Ukraine and to glory to Ukraine. My pleasure.